across the four scenarios. So I'm going to go into a little more depth now. Uh, so the two topics I'm going to, just to say, these are, this is a complete list of the topics that we dealt with and explored with in more depth by playing tunes on the core scenarios and changing them around to explore issues at, you know, at a greater level. So the first one was pathways to a low carbon energy system. And there we played on the sensitivity of the ambition of the 2050 target. We varied it between 40% reductions and 90% reductions to see what kind of implication that had. And we also played on issues about early action versus delayed action. Did you make your cuts early or did you hold on later? And what did that mean to the way that the energy system developed? I'll talk about energy security and resilience in more depth. The topic on technology acceleration and innovation UK ERC also has activities where we try to develop roadmaps for technological development of particular technologies like marine renewables, like fuel cells, etc. And one of the things we did there was to assume that all the aspirational ambitions in these roadmaps were actually realised so that technology performance and costs improved. And then we looked at what that bought you in the long term future in terms of reducing the costs of meeting very ambitious carbon constraints. And the message from that was there were substantial benefits from technology acceleration. And discounting these costs back to the present day, you could argue that that justified a certain level of investment in research, development, and demonstration to bring these roadmaps about. And the very strong message from that was we should probably be spending about four or five times as much money as we are at the moment on research and development of energy and it would be justified economically in terms of the long-term economic benefits it would bring the economy if you were trying to make ambitious, ambitious carbon cuts. Lifestyle change was much the most speculative uh, topic that we addressed. And there we hypothesized that people voluntary, you know, there was a kind of change of culture in relation to energy use. So people were prepared to change the way they travel, uh, travel less. They were also prepared to turn their thermostats down in their houses a bit. And again, we looked at that, how that worked through the energy system and demonstrated how much easier it would be to hit these carbon targets and also improve the security of the energy economy if people voluntarily did <coughs> took these, these kind of steps. But as I say, it was probably much the most speculative uh, part, part of, the, of the exercise. Natural environment, I'll come back to in more depth. And then we had one more topic, because a lot of the work we've done, a lot of the modeling is rather based on the premise, you have centralized supply of energy in large power stations. So we wanted to do another set of variants where we looked at decentralized energy, the much greater use of uh, uh, you know, microgeneration. So that was the kind of the scope of all the work streams we put in place. Now I should say that uh, you can download a, uh, a synthesis of all this work from our website. And just a little advertisement, EarthScan is publishing a book based on this project, which will be out uh, before the end of the year that covers it in a lot more depth. And finally, if you're a real anorak, we've actually put all of the spreadsheets with the results of every scenario we run in some depth onto our website so that people can download them themselves and, and you know, go into more of the depth of what we did. Because we had a lot of requests from private companies, from government and academics, saying, you, you know, what were your assumptions about heat pumps in scenario X, Y? And rather than keep answering the question, we just dumped everything onto the website and said, explore it and look for yourself. So we're trying to be as transparent as possible with, with what we're doing. Uh, just to flag up, we had a, there's a lot of modeling associated with this, computer modeling. So we had a number of key modeling tools that we used. And what, what, what we're saying, well, we spent a lot of time developing ways of what we called soft linking these models to each other. So they spoke to each other and uh, had common assumptions and common variables that was passed from one to the other. At the center of it was something called the market, the Markal model. And Markal stands for market allocation. And it's a model which basically optimizes the, the cost of running the energy system over time and chooses technologies that result in the lowest set of costs. And it's been used extensively by the government and the Committee on Climate Change 
to inform white papers, policy development, the recommendations for the UK for, for the UK carbon budgets. So it was developed by UKIRK, but it's been actually used quite extensively by government and other bodies. We've got a couple of very important network industry models. Uh, there is uh, one model WASP, which was developed by the International Atomic Energy Authority, that does electricity <coughs> generation planning in some depth. And the model we developed ourselves, the Combined Gas and Electricity Network model, which s models the gas and electricity networks at the same time using gas-fired power plants as the link between the two systems. And that was a particularly useful model for exploring security and resilience issues because we looked a lot at gas shocks. And finally, I won't talk about them, but we have three sectoral models run by our colleagues at the Environmental Change Institute in Oxford that are basically look at particular sectors in more depth. Now, another thing that I just wanted to flag up is that there is a kind of new conventional wisdom that suffuses government policy documents at the moment and also the work of the Committee on Climate Change, which is recommending the ambitious carbon budgets. And it's a story about an energy future in which electricity is decarbonized significantly because we have the technologies to do it. We have renewables, we have nuclear, and if it's successfully demonstrated, we have carbon capture and storage. It is possible to make electricity very low carbon within a couple of decades from now. And the consequence for that is if you have big carbon constraints, it means that the low carbon economy becomes a high electricity economy because you will probably want electricity through heat pumps, electric vehicles to move into sectors where electricity has not significantly played a very big role, the heat sector and the transport sector. And this story of electricity decarbonization coupled with electrification of the economy is a very big story that's dominating a number of countries' policies worldwide. Now just to say, in UKRC, our job as academics is not to just accept received wisdom. So we wanted to test this a little bit in the UK Energy 2050 project, which I'll, I'll come along to. So first of all, the question of resi resilience. Um, UKIRC, when we started this work, we recognized that energy security was an important issue. But we ourselves didn't have any expertise in Middle East politics or Russian politics. So we couldn't look at these kind of issues. We didn't have these competences. We're trying to get them in by commissioning a new project at the moment, but we, are, we didn't have them at the time. So we decided instead of pursuing security as the topic to pursue the concept of resilience with the idea that if an energy system was resilient, it could withstand shocks, but you didn't need to know what the cause of these shocks actually was. So whatever happened, the resilient system would, in a sense, be able to recover from it. And this, I won't read it through, this is the definition of energy system resilience that we came up to guide the actual work. And I could say this was a, shame, a shameless piece of plagiarism from our environmental science colleagues, because the concept of ecological resilience has been very strongly embedded in that literature for about 30 years now. And we talked a lot with the environmental colleagues to transplant ecological resilience into the energy domain and give it some meaning. So a lot of the specific formulation of this definition is actually borrowed from the ecological sciences but applied to an energy system. And I think that's one of the advantages of multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary activity is this ability to transplant ideas from one sort of area of research to another. It's something we've actually found extremely helpful. Now what do we want to be resilient against? Well, there are a number of things. One of the issues is with the low carbon agenda, it's easy because there's only one metric. You just need to count the CO2 equivalents. With resilience, it's much more complicated because people don't really know what they mean by security or resilience. It's often not very systematically thought through. But these are the things that we thought you wanted the system to be resilient against. Volatile energy prices, that's prices that go up and down you on a regular basis. Rising energy prices over the long term, which would, you would expect to see as, for example, easy oil resources are depleted. We're also worried about the much, this much more traditional approach to security, statistically predictable fluctuations 
in demand and pl plant availability. But I think what has really come up because of the UK's import dependence is the curtailment of sources of supply. And one that we've identified as really important has caused some of the biggest shocks has been temporary loss of major pieces of infrastructure.